Good evening. I am Dr. Danaya Zari. I'm Associate Professor at the Faculty of Laws at UCL and convener of the annual uh, lecture series on the International Law Commission at UCL. It is my great pleasure to welcome Professor uh, Patricia Galvao Teles to UCL virtually and to chair her lecture tonight. Professor Galvao Teles is a member of the United Nations International Law Commission. She's Associate Professor of International Law at the Autonomous University of Lisbon and Co-Director of uh, the E Academy of International Law at the Center for International Law of the National University of Singapore. She's a member of the Permanent Court of Arbitration, Legal Advisor at the Legal Department of the Portuguese Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Vice President of uh, the Portuguese Society of International Law. She's also co-editor of the OUP uh, commentary on the articles and st on state responsibility that is forthcoming. And so uh, she is really the person to give this particular uh, lecture, which is uh, entitled The Articles on State Responsibility 20 Years After. The topic is pertinent, topical, and timeless. The ILC adopted its articles on state responsibility in 2001, there has been no decision as, uh, by the General Assembly as to whether they should be turned into a convention, but the discussion on this matter remains ongoing. And at the same time, international courts and tribunals rely on the Commission's articles often in order to identify rules of customary international law. The Commission also itself has had um, and continues uh, to build um, its own work around them and on them. Um, take, for instance, the current work of the Commission on the conclusions on use Kogans. Now, Professor Agalvao Teles will speak to us for uh, 40 minutes. I will then open the floor for a 20 minutes discussion. We have already received some questions by email, but I also encourage you to uh, use the Q&A button to post your uh, questions. So without further ado, I pass the floor to Professor Galvao Teles. Thank you so much, uh, Dana. It's really a great pleasure uh, to join you um, and all the participants uh, that have uh, decided to attend this webinar. Um, uh, it's uh, great to uh, be a part of um, uh, your ILC uh, series and uh, to talk about uh, the articles on state responsibility, which I think it's one topic um, that we have in common in terms of having an interest um, on the topic and also on the uh, development um, of the, the topic. So, of course, um, because the articles um, commemorated uh, 20 years um, last year, um, it's always a good time, even if now we're uh, a little bit late, but maybe already preparing uh, what's coming and up next um, uh, since the General Assembly uh, this year in 22 um, is due to consider once again uh, the draft articles on state responsibility. But of course, when you have a symbolic anniversary, uh, 20 years old, um, uh, not uh, no longer a teenage, uh, no longer a teenager, the, the draft articles are no longer teenagers, but they've come into a, a young adult, adulthood. And we were just talking about this uh, just before the webinar started for different reasons, for more personal reasons. Um, but um, the, the, the articles on state responsibility, of course, um, continue to generate um, an important interest, uh, not only uh, because of uh, the content and the impact they have um, in terms of this uh, fundamental area of uh, international law, uh, but also because of the process, uh, not only all the interest that was generated um, in the making um, in the uh, 50 or so years that the Commission was working uh, on this topic, but also uh, in the last um, uh, 20 years, because the faith um, of the draft articles is still uh, yet to be determined. And so I think in terms of the, not only the substance, but also the process, uh, this uh, topic generates um, a great deal of interest. Uh, so what I'm um, 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 thinking of doing uh, this afternoon um, is to touch on, on three points. Um, I'll make, as, as Danai said, an initial um, intervention, and then hopefully we'll have 
um, interesting uh, questions um, uh, by um, the participants, and I would be very happy uh, to engage uh, with um, with all of you. So what I'm thinking is to make a presentation um, in three parts. Uh, one first point would be to discuss uh, the articles in the context of the International Law Commission, also to explain uh, a bit the, how uh, they were an important milestone uh, in the work of the Commission and what type of marks, uh, so to speak, they've also left um, in the work of the Commission. Um, and uh, then I just mentioned, uh, for example, that we continue to work uh, on uh, areas that are uh, related to state responsibility. Uh, but I think, uh, so in terms of substance, there's the mark there, but there's also um, a mark in terms more of the approach and the procedures. So the first point would be to um, explore a little bit, very briefly, of course, uh, the uh, articles um, of um, uh, in, uh, in, uh, uh, on state responsibility in the context of the work of the Commission. Then a second um, uh, point would be to um, uh, try to see also again very uh, very briefly the uh, developments uh, that have occurred um, in the field of state responsibility uh, in the last uh, 10, 20 years um, and to understand um, what has been the impact uh, of uh, the articles on state responsibility in terms of uh, practice. And then of course a final point about the future uh, of the articles on uh, straight responsibility, which is probably um, uh, something where nobody has a definitive answer, uh, but we can, of course, um, try to uh, discuss uh, some of the possible uh, scenarios based on what has happened uh, so far. So on, on, on the first point, the issue of uh, the uh, articles on state responsibility in the context of uh, the commission, I mean, I think everybody agrees that this has been one of the most important uh, works carried out by the Commission. Um, maybe because it was the one that has taken the longest, um, if you think, you know, in terms of uh, the statistics, in terms of time, it was put in the um, uh, topics, the list of topics uh, that was uh, prepared um, right at the beginning of the work of the Commission as topic, as topic suitable for qualification and progressive development. Um, state responsibility was there from the beginning. And um, as I said before, it took almost, um, well, more than, more than five decades to complete uh, the work uh, with uh, a, a significant number uh, of special rapporteurs during the first uh, reading, and then uh, the work uh, being concluded uh, by the late uh, Judge Crawford that was um, extremely influential uh, during the second reading where it was the, the only special rapporteur and the one that uh, wrapped up uh, the topic. Um, so certainly because of the impact um, in, in terms of the number of years and energy that the Commission devoted, uh, the breadth of the work, um, and also uh, the fact that uh, including for the second reading, and this is something that we're not seeing uh, so often uh, nowadays uh, for the second reading, this was done also in a longer period of time. Now we're doing the second readings after one year of pause where the government's comment and, and here I think the first reading was finished in 2000 and sorry, 1996 and the articles uh, in second reading were only adopted in 2001. So a longer process also uh, for the uh, second reading. Um, so I think, you know, still I've been a member um, uh, since 2017, so did not witness uh, that um, as a member, although I did witness um, part of the discussions on state responsibility as a student when I was a student in, in Geneva, and I was very fortunate uh, to be able to go to the commission meetings. Um, I was also a participant in the seminar, in the ILC seminar, and so I could see uh, the interaction um, uh, especially um, uh, well, as the first reading was being concluded, still with uh, Gaetano Aranjo Ruiz, the last uh, special rapporteur in the first uh, reading when the draft Article 19 on crimes of state was still there. Uh, and then uh, when uh, Professor, at the time, Professor James Crawford took over um, and, um, and was working on the, on the second reading. So this is also for me personally something that 
um, as an academic, as a student, I've been following uh, since uh, the early uh, early 90s. Um, and then I think another impact, certainly that uh, in the work of the commission, uh, that the topic had not just the breadth and the length of, uh, um, uh, of the time that it was in, on the agenda, um, is the number of other topics that it has um, influenced. I mean, we've had, you know, the liability, uh, topic. We had the topic on responsibility of international organizations. Um, currently, we have uh, the topic on new slogans, um, which, of course, uh, takes a lot, draws a lot on the work on law of treaties, but then it also draws a lot on the work of uh, state responsibility. And we have also a topic on uh, the current agenda on state succession uh, in relation to state responsibility. So just uh, as an example, um, areas where um, the topic of state responsibility has been influential uh, also in the work of the commission um, uh, that uh, has been in the broader field uh, of um, international uh, responsibility. Um, then I think the other um, uh, turning point, the other key point, and this is something that I have already uh, discussed in, in you know, many times, I've discussed, uh, I've, I've spoken about this and I've also uh, written about this in the Agile uh, talk blog. Uh, last year, there was a symposium uh, convened by Christian Temps and, and Federica Padeo, um, where I discussed how uh, the um, uh, draft articles on state responsibility um, influenced um, also the, um, the shape, the form of subsequent products uh, of the commission. And I think this is also very important because we are at the moment, and this is something that I felt a lot as you know, as a member of the commission, and of course I'm here speaking uh, totally in a personal uh, capacity and I'm not representing the views of the full commission or uh, of the Portuguese government or uh, no one else uh, for uh, any uh, reason, just speaking very personally. Uh, but I think this has been also one aspect that has been um, very impactful um, in the subsequent work of the commission um, uh, because it, it, it uh, and it's something that today we discuss a lot when we discuss about the future of the commission, the future topics of the commission um, is the fact that uh, um, up to 2001, up to the adoption on, of the articles on state responsibility and really the usual uh, format an output, an end result uh, afterwards in the hands of the states and the sixth committee uh, were conventions. So the commission was um, either um, uh, because um, of, you know, either in topics that was mostly codification, but even in topics with uh, some elements of uh, progressive development, uh, the uh, form um, that was chosen was the preparation of draft articles. Then they were handed in to the uh, sixth committee. This is the normal uh, procedure being an organ created by the General Assembly. The commission reports to the sixth committee and then the sixth committee would decide uh, to conclude or not a convention on the basis of the draft articles. And this is what happened you know, with many of the famous texts that everybody knows like the Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaties, um, both the one from 69 and the one from 86, uh, the Vienna Convention on Diplomatic Relations, Consular Relations, um, even the Statute of the International Criminal Court that was initially uh, prepared by the Commission, um, and uh, many other drafts, uh, including on Law of the Sea. Sometimes um, uh, some uh, younger students are not fully familiar with the whole history of the Commission, and uh, be before the UN took over, the General Assembly took over and created a, a conference, the third conference on the law of the sea that uh, led to the adoption of the 1982 uh, uh, UNCLOS, the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea, um, the um, Geneva Conventions of 1958 on the law of the sea, uh, they were initially prepared by the uh, International Law Commission. So. Typically, uh, the way of working was the production, the preparation of draft articles for consideration of member states. And in many cases, not all, but in many cases, they led uh, to the adoption of uh, international conventions. And um, when the uh, 
second reading was taking place. Um, uh, this was already with uh, uh, James Crawford as a special rapporteur. And the end um, of the work uh, was approaching. And of course, one has to recall that you know, this was a major project where the commission had worked for a long time, uh, where it had, um, you know, controversial provisions like draft Article 19 on crimes of state, um, where the first uh, reading text had also a comprehensive part on dispute settlement, uh, because it was meant to be a convention. And there were worries that, you know, a convention on state responsibility with the uh, uh, um, uh, with a part on, on dispute settlement would, you know, be a catch-all convention in the sense that almost every state dispute is a state dispute about state responsibility where you can have issues of state responsibility. And so in the end, there was, you know, the need to uh, take out the notion of crimes of state and then, you know, at least uh, uh, recuperating some of the ideas through um, uh, other um, articles and the reference to um, uh, peremptory norms and to the uh, actions by third states, uh, non-injured states, um, and uh, the um, uh, the lead, the complete deletion of the, on the part of uh, dispute settlement, um, and this was part of this a compromise that was you know the commission was divided, states were divided. Um, I cannot go too much into the de detail, but in the uh, article I wrote for the Agile the talk blog, I mean, you can find some more details and references even to, to states' positions and to members of the commission's positions. Uh, but there was a, a big division between whether the commission should propose uh, that the usual way, the usual way that uh, the sixth committee considered the convening of a diplomatic conference with a view uh, to having a convention, uh, or um, just to propose that the Sixth Committee um, and the General Assembly take note um, of uh, the um, uh, work uh, that the Commission had done. And, and because of this division that I think has to do, you know, with some, um, you know, some of the issues that ended up by being resolved, uh, like the elimination of uh, the Article 19 or the elimination on the part of uh, dispute settlement provisions, um, other issues that stayed in the text, but uh, you know, uh, still um, uh, were uh, controversial, like the part on countermeasures, um, and, and probably for countermeasures, Danai is much better person to speak about countermeasures than I that I am. Um, so you can save questions on countermeasures for Danai instead <laughs> instead of me. Um, uh, but but there was really a tension in the position uh, um, of states in the comments between the first and second reading, but then also in the commission of what to do. And, and the solution ended up by being um, a compromise solution, like it is in many cases, uh, you know, although the uh, ILC is an expert body, um, it, it's of course an expert body that works in the framework of, uh, you know, the, the political uh, world and in close connection with the states. And so uh, the end result was um, a compromise solution that consisted in a two-step approach. Uh, so what the commission ended up by proposing was that the commission, uh, that this, the General Assembly would first take note uh, of uh, the um, articles on state responsibility and only at the later stage, at the second stage, would consider uh, whether um, a diplomatic uh, conference should be convened uh, for the purposes of having um, a, a, a convention on state responsibility. Um, and this was almost the first time it happened. I mean, it was not the real, real first time. There was a precedent before, um, but it was the compromise that really marked, I think, um, what has happened in the last um, uh, 20 years, 21 uh, years in the commission, that we started having uh, more cases where the work of the commission, and this is also explained by what happened then in the sixth committee, and I'll come back um, to that in a moment, um, but this is what ha happened in, in other um, proposals, in other topics uh, where uh, the commission uh, decided to go for the two-step approach uh, rather than proposing uh, two states to conclude immediately a convention. Um, and it also, 
because, and I think that's because uh, of what happened in the sixth committee, uh, which was the fact that, uh, you know, initially there was a taking note of the articles, you know, they are no longer called draft articles, they're called articles according to the resolution um, that, uh, that uh, took note of the articles. And then uh, the um, uh, sixth committee uh, has decided to have um, a discussion uh, on whether uh, the articles should be turned in the convention. And so far, there's been no um, decision. So what we've had since 2001 um, has been uh, every three years, uh, the issue is put on the agenda of the sixth committee and states discuss, um, they come to no conclusion. So no conclusion to go forward, uh, but uh, of course, a decision to keep the issue in the agenda. So we have these technical rollovers um, every three years, and there is um, uh, no consensus because the sixth committee works uh, by consensus, although consensus is not, you know, a formal um, uh, rule. Uh, it's not in any formal rule of procedure uh, in the General Assembly, but uh, there is um, uh, in the sixth committee um, uh, a long tradition of uh, working by consensus. And uh, although, I mean, we've seen over the years that there is um, an important majority of states that would um, like to pursue the avenue of the convention, would like to uh, have uh, the articles adopted um, as a convention, a bit with the, you know, the arguments and, uh, and um, you know, we can discuss this in more detail, but with arguments about the ownership um, of international lawmaking, being from uh, states and not being from um, from the Commission uh, with arguments that, um, you know, it would become, um, you know, it would give it more visibility and, and, and more consistency in the application um, and, and states um, uh, would um, uh, have a tendency also to respect and comply uh, and make sure that this is hard law, binding law, uh, whereas um, a smaller number of states, but of course, uh, important uh, voices and vocal voices um, defend that uh, uh, having a, you know, a negotiation procedure uh, could unravel uh, the balance, could um, um, uh, have a, a, even a, um, a in, uh, an impact of uh, reverse codification in the sense that destroying a bit the, the work that had done had been done could come you know, to a weaker outcome. Uh, so there are good arguments uh, from one side uh, and, and the other, and this has led that, uh, and I think also, and I've said that this in public uh, before, that uh, the fact that uh, the discussions take place every three years, it's not very helpful because every uh, three years, it seems like the discussions are starting from scratch, from zero, um, and, and, and it's not very productive to a real substantive uh, discussion. But because of this, because uh, from the point of view of the Commission, we've seen that, the, you know, when proposals of um, uh, draft articles um, go, and of course, in later years also, uh, even if they don't take the double approach, the two-step approach, uh, but there's a proposal for a convention like the Crimes Against Humanity or the Protection of Persons in the Event of Disasters, the Sixth Committee um, has not taken action uh, in this, um, uh, with regard to these proposals. Uh, the Commission has also turned to other forms, um, other products, other outcomes. And we see that, you know, often in the last uh, 20 years where we've had only a few topics being worked as uh, draft articles and uh, many other topics being worked as uh, conclusions, guidelines, uh, principles. You know, if we think of the um, uh, work that was done on um, customary international law, the identification of customary international law uh, conclusions, uh, the work on use Kogan's currently are conclusions, the work on provisional application that we finished last year um, are um, a guide, a guide to provisional application. Um, and there's been also, but that, that one I can say I'm guilty, there's also 
been uh, some work through study groups, so the proposal of uh, study groups, groups, and I'm currently co-chair of a study group on the issue of sea level rise in relation to international law. But I'm not saying that, you know, sometimes it is justified because of the nature of the topic and the nature of the work that is uh, uh, going to be carried out. But I think there's been some, um, uh, some in a way, some um, backlash in, uh, in, in, in the commission trying to find alternative ways that would not need to go to the uh, uh, to the states to become a convention because of the example uh, of um, of state responsibility, where um, at least um, uh, you know you can think you can have the view that it's stuck in a way in 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 the sixth committee, and and it's stuck without the real meaningful discussion. I would say. Um, so I'll come back to this when um, when we uh, pick up on the issue of the future, uh, what can happen in the future, but just to and explain with this also the impact that the topic has had, not only um, in terms of the, um, uh, of, of, of the substance and of the offsprings and related topics that came about in the Commission's work, but also in the way that the Commission um, is, um, uh, is working now in terms of its outcomes. Um, but also, I think it has an impact on the relationships uh, between the Sixth Committee and the International Law Commission. I think certainly this has impacted the relations of, uh, um, of, of the two bodies. And it's, it's very hard uh, to think, I mean, this is, I think, the state responsibility um, topic. It's probably, well, you know, a good example uh, of, um, of how these relations are, you know, complex. Um, and, and, and how the two uh, bodies ended up also by influencing each other uh, mutually uh, very much. So um, uh, I'll come back to that in a moment when talking about the, the future of, of the articles. Now, the next point I wanted to make is about the, um, what happened in the last 20 years. Uh, what happened in the last 20 years. Um, without going into the details, uh, I think that would merit um, a, a longer lecture, probably. Um, um, I think that is clear um, that uh, the articles have had an enormous impact. And they've had an, an impact, I think, even before they were finished, um, you know, already being quoted uh, by the ICJ. And for example, one of the reasons for not wanting to propose a convention was, you know, when the Gabchikovonajimara's case uh, came out, you know, the number of references that the, the ICJ was uh, making to the articles, and they weren't even um, finalized by the, by the commission. Um, so, I mean, they're, they're important um, examples, um, even during the process of um, uh, preparation of the draft articles, but certainly after certainly after they were finalized in 2001, uh, where we see that uh, you know, courts and tribunals and states and international organizations, um, uh, not just academics, um, we use the articles all the time. Um, we use the articles all the time. And it's uh, worth for, uh, you know, if any of you would like to have you know, a real sense uh, of uh, this impact, um, at least one of the good things of the process of this technical ro ro rollovers uh, every three years for the debate in the sixth committee is that the secretariat has been tasked uh, with preparing um, a table uh, illustrating uh, the uh, references that international courts and tribunals uh, make to the articles on state responsibility. Um, and they also have uh, prepared uh, reports uh, with short, um, uh, with short um, uh, quotations, or at least the reference uh, to the decisions of international courts and tribunals that refer uh, to the draft articles. And it's impressive. impressive. I think the last time I counted was there were about 300 uh, decisions in, um, uh, in 30 years. And of course, I think for uh, at the international level, 300 decisions in 20 years of international courts and tribunals is a significant uh, number. It's not like uh, decisions in national courts where they're probably much more numerous. Um, and, and, and you see, I mean, I was just uh, this afternoon double checking again uh, in the last report um, with the summaries, with the quotations from the uh, secretariat 
um, they refer to almost every single draft article. Not all of them, not all of them. I mean, in some you have more practice than you have in others, um, but they almost refer, they refer to almost every draft article. But they refer to uh, the um, uh, initial part about what is an internationally wrongful act. They refer to the parts on attribution of conduct. Uh, they refer to um, uh, reparation and forms of reparation, uh, to uh, the um, circumstances precluding wrong wrongfulness. Uh, so you have a consistent uh, case law and very diverse, uh, very diverse. I mean, of course, before, besides the obvious International Court of Justice, um, you have um, a case law from ITLOS, from the International Criminal Court, um, from the regional human rights courts, like the European Court of Human Rights, the African Court, the Inter-American, but you, you even have from ECOWAS, from the Caribbean Court of Justice, from the European Court of Justice. And then um, a very interesting development, I think, also is that you have, um, uh, and, and it's probably one of the most significant areas, um, in investor state arbitration. Uh, so in the uh, arbitral tribunals with uh, created under the, 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 the PCA or UNCITRAL or ICSID or the International Chamber of Com Commerce, you have a significant number of references to the articles on state responsibility. So uh, there's been a practice developing um, and it's um, in a way because of this, because we have this sense that uh, at least I personally and some other colleagues um, that uh, the articles have had an important impact um, in international law, um, but it's not very clear, uh, and then I'll come to that in a moment, what's going to happen and, and how soon or if ever the articles will become a convention. Uh, that as Dana mentioned, um, together with my very dear uh, colleague, uh, Pierre Podo uh, livinec um, uh, and uh, and and uh, upon a suggestion, uh, because we have to give credit, and that was his idea, um, of um, Michael Wood, Sir Michael Wood, who was also a colleague in the commission, um, we've decided to propose to uh, Oxford University Press, who, who has had you know a an impressive collection of commentaries um, of conventions. Uh, to do this uh, bit unorthodox um, exercise of having a commentary um, of an instrument that is not the convention, and it's not sure it will become a convention, but it looks like one, and 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 stakeholders behave like uh, like if it was um, a convention. So we we are preparing, and hopefully it will come out still in 2022 um, at the end of the year. Um, a commentary, uh, article by article uh, commentary. And, and the idea, I mean, well, the message that we've passed to the authors of the contributors to the commentary is really to try to identify what has happened um, in the last 20 years. And not so much, you know, the meaning of the article. Of course, when the commission finished its work on second reading, there's a commentary. There's an important commentary um, explaining the the choices, the language, reference to case law. The idea of this commentary is to sort of update that and see what hap has happened in the last uh, twenty years and and how much uh, of the um, how much of the um, articles um, um, and and how and with what scope and in what sense uh, the articles can be considered as customary international law. Uh, and and we've seen, you know, if you look at the, you know, at this uh, work that the secretary at the UN secretary has been doing, you know, in many of the quotations from uh, judgments of international courts of, and, this, and, and tribunals, um, there's a reference, you know, to the fact that, you know, this article uh, represents um, on restitution, reparation, uh, or attribution represents customary and um, international law. So we're trying to map that. Um, uh, not, not, um, and I see this very personally. Not with an idea to circumvent um, any process uh, of, of of treaty making, of law making, but to map um, the status of the articles and and to give it, uh, 
you know, to give uh, the, um, uh, the, the complete to, to produce, to provide um, a, a study uh, of how the articles have behaved uh, in the last uh, 20 years and what can we make of it uh, 20, 20 years now. Um, I see that uh, uh, time is running out, so I'll move now quickly uh, to the last point about the future uh, of the draft articles. When you know, when we think about the articles 20 years after, of course, the obvious question is what's going to happen. And I have to say that I really don't know. I really don't know. I, and I don't think anybody knows. Um, um, you know, in international relations, it's very hard to make predictions and uh, you might be often uh, wrong. So I don't want to make any uh, predictions, but I, um, what I've seen, and I follow this as I mentioned to you as a student first, and then also in my role uh, in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Portugal, uh, uh, the discussions following the discussions in the uh, six committees since 2004, um, and then now uh, in the commission, you know, also looking at what's happening in the sixth committee, um, and, and it's very hard to say. I mean, I think that uh, there is, uh, from my assessment, um, is that there is a, an, an important number, a significant number of uh, states that would like, uh, because also of the argument uh, that I mentioned before, the question of the um, ownership, you know, who makes international law. I mean, about these articles, um, there's been so much discussion, you know, about soft codification you know, about uh, codification being made by the International Law Commission um, without the state stamp. Um, uh, there's been a discussion about the, um, uh, the paradox between form um, and authority. Um, that's been another, um, uh, another uh, very important uh, phrase that has been uh, used um, uh, by David Kern the late David Cairn about this paradox between uh, form and authority, because I think that everybody agrees that there's um, a lot of authority and this is also something that we're trying to uh, show with the, with the commentary that we're preparing. Uh, but the form, if we look at the form, okay, at best, it's, it's a GA resolution. It's a GA resolution that takes note of the articles. Um, and so I think we're still in the, uh, in the domain in terms of, of form of soft law, not hard law. And that's why uh, Santiago Villalpando was speaking about soft codification. And then uh, also um, uh, uh, my dear friend and, 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 uh, uh, and, and former student, uh, Fernando Luza Bordin, uh, that also spoke about the non-legislative codification. I think all these different um, uh, important uh, statements, I think, reflect very well um, the issues at stake and, and, and why uh, states should take up uh, the ownership um, of international um, lawmaking. Um, but I don't know, it's hard to say. I mean, current events, um, I think in a way, uh, they show how important um, matters of state responsibility are. Um, and how it would be uh, important to have a dedicated treaty, um, not only the current situation um, in Ukraine could call that uh, into attention, but even the pandemic. I mean, there was so much discussion during the pandemic about measures taken by states and whether they were justified by state of necessity, for example, just to give you know some um, example. So I think, you know, current events um, uh, have uh, um, highlighted uh, the relevance of having uh, clear um, rules um, uh, where you don't have to argue about whether they're customary or not, and you have them in a treaty and it's easier to apply. Um, of course, um, you may have uh, to um, a question of uh, uh, regarding a state that it's not party to the treaty, of course, that's always a possibility. Um, but then at the same time, um, the political atmosphere um, in the last um, uh, decade, more or less, uh, I think more, a little bit less than a decade, but certainly 
um, uh, in the last few years have, has not been very conducive to uh, the conclusion of new treaties, of binding treaties. And we've seen you know, the preference for soft law, resistance to new binding instruments, um, and and uh, and I'm not sure that uh, the time has come that uh, where that has changed, and I think that will continue to have a um, uh, political atmosphere that might make it difficult um, for um, a discussion. At least, you know, certainly not now, but um, uh, but might make it difficult even in the you know in the short, uh, long term, medium term, uh, for states to decide to call. A diplomatic conference um, and um, and have a convention on state responsibility. So really, I'm being very honest <laughs> with you. I don't know what the future will bring uh, in terms of the final form um, of the articles, but I do hope that uh, our book, our <laughs> commentary, will help uh, at least to evaluate, to map, um, and to evaluate um, uh, where we are uh, uh, 20 years after. Uh, the articles were adopted. So I tried to keep to my time and I stop here and I'll very gladly listen to your uh, questions and I will try to answer them. Thank, Thank you. you very, very much, Patricia, for an insightful uh, lecture. In fact, and you touched on so many different and very important um, points about the articles, uh, past form, um, substance, uh, future, um, and what has happened in the immediate intermediate period. But um, I, I will open the floor um, to discussion. Uh, please place your questions on uh, the Q&A. Perhaps I have, I think I have too many questions and I can start with perhaps mine to exercise my privilege of the, the chair to take the, the first one until uh, others um, pose theirs. Um, I, my, my, I, I, I suppose I have too many. I don't know which one to, to, to start with. Perhaps I could start with the one about, um, you're saying perhaps there's this stalemate in the six committee um, and they are stuck uh, in, in, the, in the six committee at the moment. So what is perhaps the role of the International Law Commission itself um, in relation to um, the articles in, in the future? Um, do you, predict um, or envisage that perhaps the commission might have something to, to do with the development of the articles again in the future. Is that at all useful, um, necessary, or, or perhaps dangerous possibly? Um, and then the, the other question is, well, we are discussing, we're discussing the IOC uh, uh, articles. Um, and of course, uh, we see it as a mon and as a moment that was so um, important for the Commission as one of its perhaps the most important output. Perhaps, perhaps we could put it as uh, equal to the Vienna Convention or other its draft articles on the law of treaties. Um, but the moment and an, a body has this type of moment, right? Uh, it has reached that point um, in its development. Uh, is that a peak? What does that say for, for the Commission um, itself 20 years after? And 20 years ahead, <laughs> let's say. No, thanks. I mean, I, I think that your questions are great. So um, I, I will try to answer while we see if there are more coming. Um, the, the, the first one, I think it's a, a very important one, um, but I'm not sure I have an answer uh, either. Uh, whether, if I can maybe put it in a more blunt way than you did, whether you know there's a future role for the commission with regard to the draft articles or if the articles should go back to the commission at some point. Um, and there's been precedent for that. Um, uh, there's been precedent for that. Actually, the last convention that was concluded on the basis of a draft uh, proposed by the commission and this has happened so the uh, what is now the convention on uh, um, jurisdictional immunities of states and their property uh, it had been sent to the um, the sixth committee and then the sixth committee sent it back uh, to the commission and then it went back to the uh, to the sixth committee and the, the commission and then the, the, the convention was concluded in 2004 
um, it's still not yet enforced, which is probably not a good sign. But I mean, many of its rules are certainly um, uh, have also a customary um, status, and I think you know it has been um, you know important also in influencing at the domestic level um, the um, uh, the reduction of the space of uh, absolute immunity. I think this has been also an important development. And I think in certain areas, sometimes the fact that a convention is not um, enforced, but it has the potential to be applied, the rules have the potential to be applied by domestic courts. Uh, maybe the issue is not uh, as problematic, but certainly in this case on you know state responsibility, you may have some uh, in domestic courts, but it's basically at the international level that, that you have to, to discuss it. Um, so I'm not sure. This is not something that, uh, uh, at least to my knowledge, um, has been discussed in the commission, and I'm not sure it has been discussed in the sixth committee, not that I'm aware. Um, although, I mean, there could always be the possibility uh, that the commission um, uh, would be asked by the sixth committee. I think that could not come as um, a, an initiative from the commission. I think it would have to be, you know, in the process leading up to a negotiation of a, an instrument uh, that maybe some aspects, um, you know, maybe some would be, um, would go back to the commission. But I think it would have to be based on a request from the sixth committee. It could not be something that uh, uh, the initiative would be taken by the but by the ILC itself, because I think, you know, as I think as the commission views it, you know, the ball is in the court of the sixth committee and only if requested. Um, you know, I'm, I, mean, I, Patricia, I, think, I can I yes. interrupt you for a moment. I suppose what I was thinking was uh, that the separate topics such as, for instance, the use Cogan's topic that touches mm -hmm. right now on some aspects of the articles on state responsibility. Um, and what can the Commission do over time to the article, since it's it's touching on, on very specific parts of that other project? Yeah. Is there space for developing um, the articles themselves oh, no. over time? Oh, in, that, in that sense, yes. But I think at the same time, um, and we've discussed this also, if I can make publicity uh, to a panel where we were together uh, just a few months ago uh, in um, uh, in uh, October, um, if I'm not mistaken, October last year, and it's online, it's, uh, you can find it online, um, where, where, you know, this issue of, uh, um, you know, when the Commission is working in topics that are related uh, to state responsibility, um, how much you know, how, how much can it depart from or how much can it complement? Uh, I think the commission is, is um, and this is something with that we discussed at the time, you know, in a way, um, the commission likes to be consistent uh, to the work that it's done before. And I think in the Yushkogan's topic, there is a concern to be consistent. And, and, and you'll see even now in the text that it's on second reading uh, for discussion this year, um, there's consistency, but of course we're taking it a little bit, you know, one step further because we're looking at it, you know, from the point of view of a of, of a new topic. So I think that it has that potential, of course, um, it has that potential. But I was thinking more in terms of in in a negotiation process. That's how I understood your question, and this is something that you know it would be interesting, and um, in a negotiation process, um, uh, in order to clarify some aspects uh, that there would be a mandate from the sixth committee. I think that that could be when we're, we're, when we're looking at the mix of uh, solutions that the sixth committee could take. And, and uh, you know, there's been also in the context of uh, the sixth committee, some side events um, about this. And I've also written, you know, about the containment strategy, you know, to uh, try to avoid the articles from unraveling because that, that's been a concern of the states that don't want a, a negotiation process. Um, uh, giving some role again to the commission if it was necessary, uh, that could be interesting. Um, on, 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 your other, um, on your other question, I think that's the, you know, the classical um, question of, you know, whether uh, the codification, the golden years of codification have passed. The commission has done, you know, the, uh, its major work, um, Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaties. Um, 
I would add also, I mean, when we think about the, you know, the, the, the most successful outcomes of uh, the commission's work, um, I add that all to, I add to the list for, for me, I think, um, some people, or sometimes it's not as much referred, you know, normally you have law of treaties and you have state responsibility. Uh, but for me, the, the work on diplomatic relations and, and, and consular relations, it, it's, it was also extremely successful. And, and if you measure it in, in terms of, you know, quantitatively, uh, it's been, they've been the, the, you know, the products of the commission that uh, entered into force as treaties more quickly and are ratified by more states. So I think the best selling products, if we take a quantitative approach, but also I think, you know, in terms of qualitative, uh, the Vienna conventions, I mean, even um, the world has changed so much, so much in the last uh, um, uh, 50 years, 60 years, but they, they're still, uh, you know, very much up to date, um, even with new talk technologies and the pandemic and, and, and everything. So. Yes, I think there could be an argument saying that, you know, the commission has reached this peak and that peak was reached in 2001 with the articles on state responsibility. Um, but if we look at the agenda now, the agenda that we have this year, this is the end of the quinquennium, um, 2022 year of the current quinquennium. Um, and if you think of current events, which is almost impossible not to, I mean, we have use Kogans, we have the protection of the environment in relation to armed conflict, immunity of state officials from foreign criminal jurisdiction, um, and on, you know, on the other end of the spectrum uh, related to climate change, the topic of sea level rise in relation to international laws. I think, you know, the commission is trying to find a way to keep relevant um, not not only by having states engaging and 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 engaging with its outcomes, but also putting relevant topics in the agenda that are, you know, in some cases more traditional, but in other cases also topics that reflect um, new challenges um, in international law. And I think the, um, uh, of course, you know, again, forgive me because I'm talking about the topic where I was one of the authors. Um, for the proposal and, and, and that I'm the, one of the co-chairs uh, of the study group. But I think the sea level rise uh, topic is also a bit of a turning moment um, because we've seen engagement from the sixth committee, uh, more engagement, engagement from states, uh, small island developing states that would normally not engage with the work of the commission. And we're seeing that now. So I think we have space uh, to continue to be relevant although the golden, areas of, uh, golden years of codification are gone, that's for sure. Absolutely. Uh, it, uh, you're absolutely right in terms of the topics as well that are already on the agenda and uh, on the issue of uh, sea level rise, extremely important. Uh, and in fact, for survival um, for in some instances, um, topics. But perhaps one, one question, you have tried to explain that, of course, for you, it's unpredictable what might happen mm -hmm. in the sixth committee. Indeed, I, I can understand that. And of course, the future and uh, the current state of affairs, it's also very unpredictable. So it's not easy to, 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 to see what might come in the sixth committee. But I, I, you, have, you are one of the um, um, members of the commission that have a very um, interesting um, background and, and experience in that you know the commission as a member and you have a very good understanding of the sixth committee uh, having um, also a government uh, background and an academic background uh, but that that perhaps gives us a little bit of an edge here to ask you um, what do you think might be that now 20 years later might be the the, the, the particular angle that my broker might help broker a particular uh, concession, consensus or a compromise to move forward towards a convention. Um, is, there, is there such a thing even? Is it this, a small um, uh, part where we could find a compromise? Well, I'm going to quote somebody who quoted something that uh, apparently um, the late uh, James Crawford said, um, but I'm not sure if that would do the trick. Um, I, I was told, I didn't hear that, I didn't wit witness that, but I was told that uh, the late just, just, uh, Judge Crawford said, you know, 
just take out the chapter on countermeasures and, and states would accept the convention. Um, or third party know. countermeasures possibly in the 54. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know. But I, I'm more thinking, you know, more, I don't, it, it's hard to say. I think it's hard to say. I mean, if it's something that it's there or something that it's not there or just the fact that it would be codified in the convention. Uh, but what I, I will say, I mean, also based on my um, experience, as I said, from um, somebody who's followed this from the side of the Sixth Committee um, and somebody who's looking at it now also from uh, the side of the Commission and also looking into other difficult uh, negotiation processes. Um, I don't think that um, having a discussion every three years um, is conducive to real discussions. Um, I think that's, that's something that would need to be changed. I mean, if we want to have a serious discussion, um, and, you know, that could lead to the abandoning the idea of a convention. I'm, I'm not saying I'm not prejudging the outcome, but I think that one thing that would make a real difference uh, would be to have uh, discussions on a more regular basis, more structured basis, you know, looking also at precedents, you know, what happened, you know, what kind of uh, also procedural um, safeguards we could have um, you know, opting out, opting in, trying to, you know, trying to experiment. I think, you know, for me, the uh, the goal would be to keep the articles as, as they are. I think they are excellent in the sense that, you know, I think international courts and tribunals have also um, uh, show that and they are balanced. Um, and this is one of the big arguments for not, not opening. So I think the idea would be to start with the package of the articles as, as they are and then explore um uh, around it um you know in terms of procedure uh, what could be used to make sure that this balance is not unraveled but you cannot do this if you just have you know a few year a few days of discussion every three years um i think uh, and even if you have an ad hoc committee during the uh, sixth committee you know the the time in uh, new york during the fall you know, is very busy with everything else. You would need something intercessional. Um, I think that 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 needs really to be uh, envisaged if you want to have a serious dis serious discussion and meaningful discussion about the outcome. Um, I think uh, we are actually now, um, it's seven o'clock. Uh, so I think we have come to an end for this discussion. Uh, a fantastic lecture. Thank you very, very much, uh, uh, Patricia, for uh, for discussing the articles 20 years after. And of course, we have a lot to expect uh, very soon from you as co-editor of the OUB uh, commentary. Thank you, everyone, for joining us um, and um, have a good evening. Thank you.